Thank you very much indeed. It gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Anthony Wilkinson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and for helping uh, to get this day organized. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many people here for what I think will be really an extraordinary learning curve for many and an appreciation of what music can do for humanity in general. And this is something that I planned with uh, Adam, who's been quite remarkable in getting all this uh, together for us. We were planning to do it uh, last year, which was Beethoven's um, uh, 250th anniversary. And uh, of course, he is probably the best known musician for um, his uh, deafness and how he conquered it. And we also have a play that is taking um, place later on in the festival, um, which is called I Shall Hear in Heaven, which has got members of the London Mozart players playing uh, a number of the uh, very important works that relate to his journey in life and uh, how he uh, conquered his uh, problems by producing music of extraordinarily uh, uh, wonderful, uh, basically in his head, because he couldn't hear. And this is what led to this day. And I'm really grateful uh, to Adam for having uh, added other sessions and uh, also um, curating the day. So I don't want to say any, any more, but um, to, uh, do you want to say a few words before Gina? Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Anthony, and thanks to the Wimbledon International Music Festival for hosting this day. Um, it's a day in three parts, as you know, so you're, if you haven't uh, booked to come to the other bits, then you, it's never too late. Um, anyway, I'm thrilled and delighted to, um, that Gina Miller has agreed to open the day. Uh, Gina's a true friend of the Amber Trust and personally as well through, through contacts with, with, with Derek. Um, who's going to be playing later. So, Gina, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me today um, for this extraordinary event, which I think will really open our minds, as it were, to music and neurodiversity. As um, Adam has said, uh, I've been uh, in this space for some time now, actually 33 years, yeah, because of the birth of my first daughter, who uh, was born, and I'm so looking forward to my beautiful daughter, um, arriving, so I'm not going to be mine. Um, uh, but uh, she was starved of oxygen at birth, and I spent the next few years struggling as a single mother all those years ago when people didn't really talk about um, special needs, how could we assist children on the spectrum, support them in schools, um, and music. Nobody talked about those things in those days. So I took time off work and spent five years, most every hour of the day and night with her, watching her, learning from her, and realizing that music was a very important part of unlocking all her talents. Whereas others that I met, specialists, especially medics, kept talking about what she couldn't do, about her disabilities. I wanted them to talk about what she could do, her different abilities, the joy that she naturally exuded. And all the children like her that I met over those four or five years that I was struggling. But slowly, people started to talk about, what, about, in a more positive way, about children with special needs, adults on the special needs spectrum. So it was 10 years of real struggle for me until in the late 90s, this word, neurodiversity, arrived. And it was literally music to my ears because I didn't have the language or the knowledge to explain to others the joy that she was bringing to the world, to what I was being taught about by her, about compassion, humanity, happiness, about giving people a chance, 
about literally just embracing people with a hug and making them feel better. That she had so much to offer that the world had seemed to forget that us as human beings need to keep us stable, safe, and actually well. Then, as I said, this word and this concept arrived and actually articulated everything that I had felt instinctively for 10 years. 30 years on, I think neurodiversity is now begrudgingly accepted in some parts of the profession, but it is important, I think, because of what it teaches us, not just about transforming work and education, but actually about society itself, about what we value as we go forwards, not least as we encounter the revolution of technology and digitization. In a world where robots and AI and clever technology will take over. More than ever, I think we need to preserve what makes us human. And the pandemic has done something very strange. It has actually amplified what we were already rethinking, our concepts of how we interact with each other, how we judge worth, how we judge each other, how we actually embrace communities caring, compassion, kindness, all words and concepts that sit within the neurodiversity concept and field. So we are at an important point 30 years on, I think, with neurodiversity. I think it is a springboard to where we can become better human beings, not just unlocking people's special needs to be better contributors to society. And on that note, I'd say, this is a wonderful event. I hope you enjoy it. And do please get more involved. This is an important part of our research going forwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gina. It's, it's very powerful um, testament, really, to, to our beliefs, I think, that um, we all espouse. Now, I'm really delighted to um, welcome my colleague and student, but not for much longer, uh, Caitlin Shaughnessy. I'm going to embarrass her and say she's got her PhD viva this week, so I'll be thinking of her on Thursday. But she'll be talking a bit about her amazing research she's done with um, families with young children on the autism spectrum. Um, I really take my hat off to Caitlin because Caitlin's one of those people that doesn't do dry academic research in a library. She gets on her hands and knees and works with, with children and families. Um, and I think you, you work with over 30 families for about two years, so hats off to you. And got some really powerful findings about just how powerful and important music can be for those families. So thank you, Caitlin. Um, thanks so much, um, Adam, and for having me here today. Um, as he said, I'm going to be talking a bit about my research on autism and music. It kind of has always been a, a long-term interest for me because I also grew up with an autistic brother, and as I was kind of training and doing lessons as a musician, his little face would appear at the door as I was practicing, and then he would kind of sing the melodies that I was practicing as he was going to sleep, and he always had this interest in music, and so that's really where it started for me. But as Adam said, I've been doing a PhD over the last couple of years, and I've really looked at how music can help families with autism. And so technically the title is The Impact of Autism on the Development of Musical Abilities in Childhood. But really what it is, is the impact of music on the development of autistic children and how music can help um, kind of provide them with an outlet for expression and development and interaction really. So this is Romy.
So I thought that was a really nice example just to start to show how musical interest and musical talent in autistic children can, can really go further than what they might be perceived to be able to do in everyday life. Um, Romy has been learning piano for how long with you now? Um, about 12 years. 12 years and she's kind of she's always shown this real interest and in, in ability that seems to surpass um, what she can do kind of within everyday environments and that's that's really what I found across the spectrum. So a kind of a really brief overview of what autism is. It's referred to as a spectrum condition. People also talk about it as being a constellation or a rainbow, really, because it's a complete mix of all of these different factors that d affect people in different ways. And for some, this can be kind of difficulties in social communication, but at the other end of the spectrum as well, it can kind of profoundly impact um, daily life and it quite commonly um, is associated with intellectual disability as well. So social communication is maybe the, the headline that uh, most people think about when they think about autism and difficulty in interacting with other people. Um, we also know as well that as neurotypical people, we, we are not very good at understanding and reading the, the behaviours of autistic people. So it's a double-edged sword there that we're not, some people, we're not understanding each other. Um, emotional understanding and reading and interpreting the emotions of others is also commonly um, associated with autism and difficulties in kind of understanding why people are reacting in the way they are. Sensory sensitivities is also can be associated with it and it's, it's kind of profoundly impact well-being in everyday life. If you think about walking down the street with loud noises or particular textures, that can be um, really affect people's um, well-being as kind of interacting in everyday environments. So language and learning delays are, can also be quite commonly associated, but it's, it's difficult because if you have an intellectual disability, you might not ever talk at all, um, whereas some people might develop language, some children might develop language a little bit later. And a lot of the priorities of the families that um, I was working with was their children weren't talking and they couldn't understand what they needed and what they wanted. And so using music and using strategies in order to just really help their children in everyday life, when, what they wanted to eat, what foods they didn't like because of their sensory sensitivities. These kind of things were really at the forefront of the family's needs. And finally, special interests and talents. So if you think about autism in the media, um, quite commonly you'll think of the, the geniuses or the, the savants, those that are kind of really exceptional at what they do, like, like Derek. And um, more generally as well, the sense that kind of being able to zero in and take real pleasure from a talent or from a particular interest ha is also really commonly associated and, and used for autistic people. So what we know so far about music and autism is generally, there's been a fair amount of research on it, but it's quite anecdotal. We do know that they have a higher rate of perfect pitch. So this is where you can identify a pitch um, when it's played on the piano. I think in autism, it's about one in 400, whereas in the general population, it's about one in 10,000. So there is some kind of relationship there that is going on that really, there's an affinity within this kind of sound environment. Um, examples of musical savants, Derek, um, individuals that have kind of exceptional talent um, with music and also are autistic. And also just general experiences of families after families after families talking about the importance of music in their children's lives. And when it's surrounded, as Gina was saying, by the kind of the patholog pathologicalization and the medical descriptions of their children and what they can't do, the interest in music and what the, the expression that that gives them has been really, really important. So why are musical space is special? What, what is it about music that kind of creates this environment for kind of unimpaired interaction? So we know that music in childhood is really important anyway. Our first interactions as babies are kind of pseudo musical and um, children consistently integrate music in, in their play. We're in nursery rhymes with kind of turn taking and rules with, in games. And it's very much the same thing for autistic children. It provides a, a kind of a medium that is easily understandable. Unlike with everyday speech, music is, has kind of clear endpoints, it has clear rules, and that kind of provides an avenue to which they can interact um, kind of more readily. So what some of my research looked at was how are families using music and how can we really harness this uniqueness of this musical space 
um, to, to better support development. So these are just some of the families um, I've worked with. And we asked them to, to kind of continually update us with what they were doing. Um, we sent them a, well, I came along with a, a little keyboard and a box of instruments and, and showed them little games and strategies, really, musical strategies um, to use in everyday life. So 30 families over 12 months kind of worked with me, gave me continuous updates on how their music was developing in everyday life. And I would go at four points, interrupted somewhat by the pandemic, to kind of see how they were doing and also how their musical behaviours had changed when we were able to support them properly, when we were able to show them how to kind of nurture their children's interests. So this is the only graph of the day, I promise. But... Um, what you can see here is really what we wanted to see, which was the line of musical development going up. Um, so what we used to monitor the children was actually what we expect to see in neurotypical children. So the development of musical skills um, in general that has been observed, which you'll hear about um, a little bit more later today, I think. So what we saw is that all the children were able to develop and improve musically in the same way that we would expect normal children to, but they just weren't as explicitly tied to age. What you might see here is that the dots at the beginning were really spread out, so there was a big variety in, in the, the families that I was working with and what their children could originally do. And this was predicted by how kind of profoundly autistic their children were. Their children were really not speaking and had quite difficult behavioural issues. They were scoring a little bit lower, but we were able, I was able through kind of supporting the families and supporting their musical development to get them up and, and encourage that development anyway. So really, even though at the start, um, the behavioural difficulties and autism seemed to impact upon their musical abilities, actually, it was just about unlocking those strategies for the parents and for each individual child to, to help them develop musically. So what we found is that, as kind of parents have been saying for, for years, is that the autistic children were really engaged within these musical spaces and did seem to interact better than they did in everyday life or wanted to interact more than they did in everyday life. All children, no matter what their um, level of disability, had the capacity for musical development. And when we provided them with the right strategies, they were able to improve. For some, and for many actually, this was the, their musical abilities were much more advanced than the communication and behavioural um, abilities. So, for example, those that didn't speak very much could sing really well, or those that kind of were very isolated within themselves in everyday lives were very playful and turn-taking and interactive within musical play. But for, for some families and for some children that had kind of additional needs, you need, they needed this extra support, they needed um, the instruments and the resources that we provided as a way to kind of unlock this potential. So I thought I'd just, to give a richer picture, just give some of the feedback from the parents that we got about the music and its importance to them. So he does talk, but not as well as he sings. So he'll now sing a complete song, all the words complete and everything. I don't know how that must feel for him to be able to sing because it must feel really good to be able to sing everything out if you can't really talk. And that's what the really lovely feedback that we got and that I got from all the families was the, the role of expression and the, the outlet that music provided as a way to, to release and to, to interact on a world that they were more in control of, that they felt confident in, that wasn't associated with the, the difficulties and the trauma and everything that was um, seen in, in kind of normative social environments. So how can we better support this and what implications does this have for kind of how music can continue to help? So what we saw is that um, social interaction, as we measured by kind of behavioural questionnaires, did also improve as their musical abilities improved. So there was some level of transfer that as the kids were doing more musical play and interacting more within music, they were also being able to apply this in everyday life. As we know with general kind of neurotypical research in music, emotional regulation is a really important part of why we use music. And for the, for the children and for the parents, this was really important. 
um, autistic children can have really difficult behavioural um, needs because they haven't quite learned yet how to, to regulate and using music as a way to kind of manage these emotions, kind of direct the meltdowns and, and kind of negotiate those really difficult periods was also really important. Communication as well. Um, so the children showed if they were more interested in music in everyday life than normal speech, and why wouldn't you, because it, it sounds better. Um, by teaching and kind of communicating with the children through music, they were able to, to teach their children daily life skills, so washing your hands, or this is the time that we need to eat, this is the time that we're going to bed, and managing those transitions. And this kind of use of music as a part of everyday strategies, again, was really a way to, to, to prevent some of the the difficulties that these families have been having in everyday life, just because purely miscommunications between the children's needs and the parents' um, difficulty in understanding those needs. So apologies for the long quote here, but I, I just think it really encapsulates um, the role of music um, for this, this family and for some of the families. So I think the fact that one of the things about it is that it gives him attention. I think being autistic and nonverbal is lonely. And I think the music gives him an audience. It gives him something to be able to be seen. Can you imagine not being able to verbalize? And so this shared sense, it's like you're piercing into his world and giving him that time. And that's what he has enjoyed and has really made an impact upon him in that way. And I think what music does, it allows and makes people engage if you can't speak, it engages and connects. It connects both worlds, his world, your world, and he gets that attention. By piercing through, that has allowed him to become more sociable, more like connected to people. And this idea that, that the space, the musical space, the musical play was unique in this sense that the children were in control and could really interact on their own terms and be provided with an interaction and an interactive experience that they didn't want to access or couldn't necessarily access in everyday life. And again, thinking about emotional regulation as well, we still don't entirely understand what is going on in musical spaces, but we know that it's a space that you can just kind of get into and be taken away from. And I'm sure everyone here has also experienced that when listening to music. So he's much calmer, and when he listens to music, he's actually enjoying it, although you might not, it might not be something that an outside person can recognise. You might think that it is a racket, but for Thing, he is definitely, it is definitely doing something great. This is what he does when he is happy. And having this outlet was also um, reflected in the way that the children showed interest individually in how they accessed the resources and the instruments that we provided. So what, how can we kind of better support this and create, um, support more families to, with this, mu these musical strategies? So firstly, we found that um, the affinity to patterns was, was really important and music is underpinned by patterns from kind of the very first nursery rhymes to, to Beethoven symphonies and encouraging and showing the children how it built up out of those patterns was a kind of first way to really, to really harness their interest there. Secondly, easy access to instruments. So we brought the instruments and I left them at the homes of the families and the parents talked about the ability to just go and pick up the keyboard or pick up a, a maraca or a tambourine and explore it on their own terms it was really important to build the confidence of the children, which meant that when they were playing, they felt like they were kind of in, even, in an even partnership with their parents or their siblings or, or me or whoever they were playing with the importance of everyday exposure as well. So instead of maybe an hour's music therapy session once a week or, or once a fortnight, these kind of 10 minute micro blocks of play that the parents would do maybe at the kitchen table or after dinner, those were every day just kind of gradually, gradually increasing. The, the children showed much more responsiveness to that. And also the importance of allowing the children to, to be in control, to develop their confidence and do it themselves through self-directed exploration. So instead of trying to teach the children, they were all very able, more able than many adults have seen to able to pick up the patterns on the keyboard and just kind of fly with it. They wanted to control themselves. They had very clear preferences of the music that they wanted to try and play, the, um, the different instruments that they felt most affinity to. And so allowing this and allowing the children to really 
go use their own interest to further um, their musical development was a key way to then kind of bridging the gap here. And so finally, I just want to think about this from the lifespan perspective. So what can we really do there? I've said that there are kind of developmental implications about how we can support children, but it's, it's not kind of a miracle. It, instead, it's just a really important way of building kind of resilience and well-being within lives and supporting neurodiversity within kind of the framework of life. Um, this is my brother, I think a couple of years ago now. Um, and for him, he has an intellectual disability as well as autism. And he will always um, very much kind of need be cared for and things like that. But music is a way for him that he can interact with other people, have friends, create a shared interactive space. And for, for me and for Adam and for people that he meets, he enjoys doing music with them as a way to connect with them. So as you can see as well, as I've described Gabe's, his musical abilities go far beyond his ability in language or his, his interest in language, really. This is how he communicates. Um, but yeah, it, he's not um, ever going to be a concert pianist, and, but it's just very much for him, it is his reason for life and it, it, it brings so much happiness and joy to the, our family, to him and to I think everybody that cares for him as well. That For me, that's really what the crux of my research is about and the importance of music for just kind of bringing it, bringing joy and life to, to these families. So thank you very much. so much Caitlin that was um, I mean truly enlightening and inspiring I think um, apart from the John John said he I didn't know you could play scales on the piano Adam I thought that was a little bit rude anyway has anyone got any um, quick questions for Caitlin yeah, yeah uh, John, would you approach with the children uh, a standardized approach or did you in straight away draw from what they've done before what they have and what their families was it all very individually sort of tailored yeah, it was very individual. We, I kind of wanted to show the parents that you didn't need to be musically trained at all to be able to, to kind of use the instruments and the resources. So when I got there, I just saw where the children were at, incorporated the parents and just played with them really, um, without kind of using any, anything too complicated. Yep. Yes, Steve. My son used to play the same music over and over again. Does that make it more meaningful for him? Should I encourage him? Or I felt it was a nice quiet time for me because he was mm. committed. Yeah, I think was it maybe you that was telling me about this research that um, they've shown, there's been some research by one of um, Adam's other students that um, when we listen to music as, as neurotypical people over and over again, it kind of loses its emotional valence. But for autistic people, that doesn't necessarily happen in the same way. So they're getting similar emotional responses every single time they listen to because it. Because they get less in the first place. I don't uh, think so. Shall I, shall I show? So um, I had a student called Haley who, um, uh, she played, she was interested in how um, unexpected music can be. So for example, she would play people a melody like this. Um, And probably all your brains, as you heard that top note, if you're in, in an fMRI scanner, there'd be a little peak because you're, it's something unexpected, so the brain's dealing with that in a particular way. What Haley did, she got people to rate with her finger on a scale as they listened to melodies how unexpected or expected they thought things were. And she did it four times 
one week and four times another week. So the experiment would go like this. She'd go... And the children would be pushing their finger up and down. And obviously when it got to that top note, they'd be a bit, a bit more to the right. What she found was that gradually, as you'd expect, their, the line of sort of emotional intensity gradually flattened out because you, I suppose they got bored with it, if you like. If I keep playing it, it doesn't sound so un unsurprising now, does it? But by the end of the day, or in her case, a week later, if I played this again, your brain would have kind of reset a bit, so it would sound a bit surprising again. And she did it another four times. And gradually, neurotypical responses tended towards this flat line. In other words, people got bored with it. She did the same thing with a group of autistic children, and every time they heard the melody, it was like they were hearing it for the first time. They, they, they were just as um, excited, if you like, at the, the other unusual note, even after eight hearings. And it's almost like, I think, in the, I don't want to call it autistic brain, but in the way that some autistic people process sound, um, it's almost like there's a switch. And when they hear something again, it's like it's for the first time. And I think that's why Romy, who you heard at the beginning of the clip, she will play literally the same piece, not 10 times, you know, a song like an auctioneer, not 100 times, but even over 10 years, she'll still want to play the same melody sometimes. And I'm sure for her, it's because she still gets that buzz out of the unexpected. So that's just one example, I think, I think we'd, we'd say, Caitlin, that, um, that the, the deep... Um, emotional response that autistic people can have to music. Not only is it sometimes deeper, but it lasts longer as well. And I always say when, when I'm, as a teacher, you know, boredom is a long distant um, thing behind me. The autistic child is still, oh, it's great, isn't it? You know, I still love that unexpected note. And I mean, Gabriel um, is, is astonishing. I mean, Gabriel likes to bounce, doesn't he, and run around and you think, what's going to happen? He sits at the piano and he'll sit for an hour, absolute white hot concentration and play. He's extraordinary, isn't he? In fact, Derek's over there, we're going to hear from him in a minute, and we just left Derek and Gabriel to play on two pianos a few weeks ago, and, and they, you hadn't met Derek, and we just left them for an hour and a half, and they just played together. That's, that's the power of music, to link people for whom language doesn't really do much, does it? And I think your father was there and your mother was watching on Zoom, I'm deeply moved by this incredible relationship that we hadn't we weren't there, we weren't refereeing, they just got on with it. It was really quite, quite touching. So, once again, thanks so much, Caitlin, that was fascinating. John Lubbock is a true friend and colleague over many years. Um, John, I think you saw Derek on television about 15 years ago. And the next day, John turned up at my place of work and said, I want to work with that man. <laughs> and um, by the way, can't you get him a better piano? I seem to remember you said, John. Um, John, you, you, you just see it as you, you speak, as you see things. So you've always been direct and honest and a fantastic, fantastic friend to Derek. Can I just say one anecdote? John commissioned someone to write a piano concerto for Derek to play with his orchestra in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. And um, about two weeks before, John, you were really seriously ill with, with, with something that was potentially lethal or a condition. And the doctor said, you must lie down for three weeks. And John, you, you got up, and I remember you conducting, sitting down, gray and sweating, but you weren't gonna let Derek down. And I thought at that moment, wow, you know, it's just amazing. Um, so thank you, John, for all you do. And you're gonna talk a bit about your orchestra, which you set up 50 years ago in your charity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I started my orchestra 55 years ago. The orchestra is from John's in the square. And 26 years ago, my fourth son was diagnosed with autism. And at the time I was running around the world and <clears throat> so was my wife as a singer. And we stopped all traveling which actually was a blessing. People think all those hotels and airports are rather glamorous if you don't do it, but if you do do it all the time, it's very tiring and expensive, and so we were delighted to give it all up. Anyway, so we had a bit of time on our hands, obviously, so my wife had the brilliant idea of starting a 
a charity which involved the two things that obviously our life was now entirely devoted to, which was music and autism. And actually, it, it, it must be the simplest project going in the music world. I simply take my musicians into special schools and we just play to these children. And we don't do anything else. I've, I've been involved in various very good projects, clever projects, the Royal Opera House and Wigmore Hall and various places. And they involve autistic children, but those projects eliminate probably 80% of the children we play to because they make demands, you have to do a certain thing at a certain time. Well, most of the children we play to, that's just not gonna be possible. So there is no disability in the schools that we, we go to who don't benefit from these concerts. And because they have this complete lack of inhibition and sort of teenage, you know what teenagers are like, um, they just respond so wonderfully to the music. As I say, we, we really, we just do what we do, which is perform music, which we do all the time. And the music does it all. They, they respond immediately. They dance, they sing, they conduct. They may sleep. You know, I, I see a child sleeping, I think, oh God, he's bored. And then I see the teachers crying. And so I say to the teacher after, what's going on there? She said, well, he's never sat still in his life and he's 10 years old. And he spent 20 minutes completely still. So, I mean, there are some, so we went to a school this week <coughs> called The Forum down in Shaftesbury, and I think it has the most severe children. It, the, the staff is two or three to one, staff ratio pupil. And every time I go and we start playing to them and I think, oh gosh, are, are we doing anything, you know? And then I see the teachers in tears. So the, the change may be very small and maybe even possible for me to understand because I don't know the children normally. But there just, there just isn't a disability that's so great that this music, the magic of music, does something, whatever it is. We had a child the other day on a bed, helping to breathe, apparently nothing going on, and a carer and a father, and the father was just completely blown away. And he saw something in that child, you know, a tiny little movement, tiny little smile, a little movement of the foot, it doesn't matter how small, it's just so extraordinary. And it's these, these concerts, as I keep saying, we don't really do anything clever, so I don't claim any, any brilliance on this subject at all. It's just the most extraordinary manifestation of the power of music to speak to these people. And because they have absolutely no barriers and no inhibitions, you know, we've had all this stuff bashed out of us by parents and teachers. And we're, you know, we, we sit like all you guys are sitting very, very well and behaving. Well, they don't go to for any of that, of course. And, so, and that's so wonderful to see. And my musicians absolutely love it. You know, we can play for 40 minutes in a concert hall, a Brahms symphony. Nobody moves a muscle. You know, and, and then there's a bit of this at the end. But these kids, you know, immediately we start. They're up and doing all these wonderful things. He knows, he sees it all the time. We do loads of concerts with Derek for, for these children. So it really is the simplest project you can imagine but it's such a strong manifestation of the extraordinary power of music to get through to these children and help them in every way. It helps their confidence. I get them to come up and conduct. And honestly, I, I wish I'd brought some film. It's, it's extraordinary how they respond to the music, some of them, within a millisecond. If there's a long note, you know, they do this, and then there's four semic waves, and they do this, and then there's another long note. And they don't know the music. I mean, the response is, absolutely instantaneous and sometimes I get them to conduct the ones who can clearly sort of understand and have got some competence in this I say to them okay you conduct any way you like and the musicians will play they play any notes but they play the feeling of the of what the conductor is doing so if he's doing slow stuff or he's fast stuff or he's loud or it's quiet or it's, and it gives them this extraordinary power which they have such a lack of in their own lives um, and honestly, the expressions on their faces is just absolutely extraordinary. So I keep saying, you know, what we do is so simple, but that, that's it. But I do just want to go off um, on a tangent, if I may. No. Shut, <laughs> shut up. John definitely doesn't ever do what you're told to. <laughs> Your turn later. I just want to acknowledge massively what Gina said about the business of celebrating what these people can do. 
I have never, this is a bit of a rant of mine, but I'll give it to you anyway. I have never referred to my son as disabled. In every, in every example of a word with dis in it, which means un, it's complete. So if you dislocate your shoulder, it is completely dislocated. If you dislodge a tile on your roof, it is completely dislodged. Dishonest, well, all the dis is, except for disabled. But the psychology is, it, is that, oh, he's disabled. The whole of him is disabled, him or her, which is awful, awful, awful. I mean, just watch the Paralympics. Can you describe those people as unable? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. So I hate the word. So I want to start a movement. I'll start it right now. Um, get rid of the S, replace it with an F. Disabled, differently able. Everybody in this room is differently able. Anyway, you can help me. I'm, I've got another 20 years. By the time I die, I, I want this word to disappear. I hate it, hate it, hate it. And I think that I think the Italians say differently abled, actually. So it's not it's not an original, original idea, but it's so positive. And you know, I think wh wh one of the awful sort of psychological things in society of the word disabled is it allows society to put all these people in a box, slightly to, to the side of life. Whereas actually, they could be one of the most powerful groups of people in the world. If every school leaver, Bolshe school leaver who's thinking of getting a knife or a drug or any of that nonsense, if they had three months with a so-called disabled person as a sort of compulsory voluntary service in a care home or with some of the children we're talking about or in any so-called disabled, it would completely transform their life and, and reorganize their priorities and make them realize what they have when they think they haven't got anything because they haven't got enough money for a new pair of trainers. It would completely change all that. So they could be such a powerful group in society to teach us. There's so much joy. I mean, Gina was talking about that. My son, honestly, I can't begin to tell you what the joy he brings. His parents and his brothers, all the people he can contact with. He's just a lovely, lovely boy. And so many of these people I see, we played to 200,000 children now with our charity over the 20 years. And they, they just come into the room and they just exude all this lovely stuff. And they're, they're, what they can't do is just not interesting. And it's not really them. What is them is what they can do. And they can love and they can smile and they can love the music. And Anyway, that's the end of my rant. <laughs> Slightly, because I think this um, differently able takes us on to some of the extraordinary people who have, um, uh, on different parts of the spectrum, who have actually, uh, dare I say, someone like Mozart. I mean, I know somebody in this community who um, doesn't relate to uh, other social um, uh, norms but he's an absolutely brilliant scientist. He's a person who's um, developed uh, algorithms uh, that actually led to um, uh, a lot of the great computer games. Um, he absolutely adores music. Within 30 seconds of being married, he and his wife joined two members of the Magini to play um, a Handel Quartet. He is obsessed by music. And I think um, uh, here we're talking about um, uh, uh, different sort of abilities, and I think some people, because of their power of concentration, uh, have actually delivered extraordinary things uh, to humanity. Yeah, well, it is being. It's be like it, it is beginning to be embraced. I mean, uh, there's a company in Germany. I can't remember what it's called. Three letters. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Their whole IT department is autistic. And they have this unbelievable focus. My boy went into, we've tried to get him various jobs unsuccessfully. We went into a business and they said, could you put all the information on these spreadsheets, uh, on these uh, receipts, onto a spreadsheet? So he's diddling around. Very good, very, very good on the computer. Diddling around. The managing director comes along, stands behind him. He's completely reorganized the method. There's all these highly paid people in the next room taking two hours to do what he did in 20 minutes. Because he's, he looked at it and he thought, well, that's ridiculous. 
this is how we'll do it. And then he didn't employ him. You know, what can you do? It was just so unimaginative not to, I mean, he, he was only going to go an hour a week with a carer, so it wasn't going to be any problem. But he had actually transformed a small part of that business. And this, this, this um, Richard Branson, I think, is now embracing this too. He's got a lot of autistic people in his business. And this, this incredible concentration, you know, and they don't stand at the water heater talking about EastEnders last night because they don't, they're not interested. Yeah, Gina. Uh, I was just saying there is a lot of work going on in um, workplaces and companies. Yeah. Because what they're finding is that uh, to embrace the talent yes. of neurodiversity yes. is a huge boost for their companies, but it does have an up on effect to the way workspaces are designed and also um, assessments of individuals and application forms. So there's a huge rethink that needs to happen around all of it, but there is now a shift in thinking that as we embrace the future, in particular technology and you know, powerful AI, that there seems to be some connection between mathematics, music, yeah. the way the brain works, and, and sort of in that side of the brain. Yeah. So there is more work being done there. But I, what I find absolutely disgusting about this is I do know in a particular profession that those individuals are being paid much less. Yeah, of course. Demanding. So somebody going into the profession from a neurotypical Set it on the group qualification will earn, say, for example, 60,000, whereas somebody with a diverse background is earning 25. And that is wrong. So there's a lot of really denying. Oh, I, I, I mean, it's only in baby, baby steps, but I think people will come to realize, as you say, particularly as the world becomes more technological, and these kids have, un, un, I mean, my son, you know, if I've got a problem on the phone or on the telly, and he does it so far, I say, could you teach me? And he goes, woof, 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 it's done. And I haven't a clue what he's done, and he can't do it slower. But I mean, you know when you go into somebody's house, you never see the same video player as yours. So you can't work it. He can work everybody's video without any pre-thinking. He just gets the, the old whatnot, and it's all done. So, please. And um, going back to the employment issue, um, there is a charity, one of mine, as it so happens, um, called Autistica, which really focuses on helping to set a gold standard for employment, helping employers, helping individuals, and the theory of how to get into employment, how to keep employment, and they operate with both the high, the genius type level uh, of mathematicians and computer scientists, and people like my son who, who are at best good perhaps make an ashtray. Yeah. Well, uh, that's wonderful, and the faster this happens, the, the other benefit, of course, is that the other people um, in the company will learn. I mean, my son was at Lord Bill's at um, TAME. He was on an in autistic unit in a comprehensive school. But his tutor class was from everybody in the school of his age. So him and maybe another of his mates, and then all so-called ordinary children. And they learned as much from that. And, and because they, you know, they have those five years, when they come out of that, these people are just people. They've got this problem, they've got their own problems, whatever it is. They're not, you know, here. They're just part of their community. And they've learned to understand that these people are just people. They've got a bit of a problem for this or that. But it, it isn't a sort of separating thing, which this horrible word disability does. It separates them from us. We've all got problems. Right, I'll shut up. No, thanks so much, John. And thank you as well, Gina and, and Steve, because um, there, are, there are really exciting initiatives going on at the moment, but we can't do them fast enough. And of course, the, the, the thing that's hardest to change is, is culture, if you like, is the attitudes. And that um, is just something we all have to chip away at constantly.